Hi, I'm Stephen Tallamy. A little while ago I did a video about the Roland JV1080 and whether it still has a place in modern media composition. The video seemed to be quite popular and some people had asked if I could make something similar about the other synth in my rack, the Emu Proteus. Like the JV1080, the Emu Proteus is a blend of sampler and synth and was another workhorse in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now before I go into the synth itself, I thought it would be useful to have a little look at the history of Emu, which was founded in 1971 by Dave Rossum. Now Dave was based in California and used to hang out with the likes of Rob Moog and Tom Oberheim and many others. And Emu as a company actually first started out as being a maker of modular synthesizers. Now as part of building this modular system, he had to solve a lot of different issues that have been influential in the making of modern synthesizers. He came up with the first polyphonic keyboard and also started to use custom audio chips within his synthesizers. Now something that changed directions for Emu was when Dave went to the AES convention and saw the Fairlight CMI. Now as a sampler of course that could hold orchestral sounds, it became very popular with media composers. Let's not forget of course Brad Fidel used it in the Terminator 2 soundtrack. Now an issue with the Fairlight was that it was big, bulky and expensive, making it out of reach for most musicians. But with Dave's experience in synthesizers and custom silicone, he figured that he could create a sampler that was both less bulky and less expensive. Hence was born the Emulator. Now whilst developing various generations of this sampler, Emu was building up a sound set of samples it could use inside of synthesizers. And so in 1990, Emu came out with the first Proteus, which was a synth with onboard sounds stored within ROM. The Proteus 1 was followed by Proteus 2 and Proteus 3, which added orchestral and world sounds to the palette of Proteus options. Now these rack mounted modules became even more popular as people started to transition away from having workstations with built in sequences to using computer based sequences. And this led to an acquisition of Emu by Creative Technologies who are probably most well known for creating the Sound Blaster range of sound cards that went into PCs. With the financial stability offered by Creative Technologies, Emu was able to release a whole range more of these Proteus modules and in 1999 they released the Proteus 2000. So this is my Emu Proteus and you'll see it's not a Proteus 2000, it's a Proteus Custom. There's not really any major difference there. The Proteus 2000 came with the Composer ROM. Uh, this one had the Composer ROM and a few other ROMs inside of it. So it's effectively it's a Proteus 2000 plus a few other ROMs and we'll see them in a little bit. So the Proteus was used in quite a lot of different media composition. I spoke to Christian Henson um, and he used it quite a lot with Anne Dudley in Monkey Bone and Tenth Kingdom. But probably the most well-known sounds from the Proteus uh, composer ROM are those uh, from Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell who wrote all of the original Thomas the Tank Engine music. So here is the clarinet. Um, I'm not sure if this is the exact patch that um, they will have used. They probably tinkered with them a little bit, but you'll get the idea. And of course, if you listen to the Thomas music, you will hear that it is very orchestral in nature. Uh, go back and listen to some of the stuff from the 2000s uh, and you'll, you'll hear how much orchestral music is being played, but it will have been coming from these types of modules. This is another bit of Thomas the Tank Engine and it's from uh, one of Edward's themes. And you can really just pick any of the orchestral sounds on these Proteus modules and you'll come up with something that sounds a bit like Thomas the Tank Engine. So you could see why it would be popular in media composition, but there are also a whole bunch of synth sounds that are created from orchestral elements. So this is a string sound, but more of a synth. Now there are a bunch of obviously really nice uh, keyboard sounds or electric pianos in particular.
late 80s, 90s, of course, lots of keyboards with pad sounds as well. So lots of kit sounds as well. Um, let's just use the audition button for this one. And if you are familiar with the Halo 2 soundtrack, then you'll recognize this loop. So this Proteus Custom has a bunch of additional ROMs inside of it, and one of them is the sounds of the ZR. So the ZR was one of the uh, Esonix uh, keyboards, and this is one of the patches on there. It's called Perfect Piano. So William Oakley was uh, well known for creating this Perfect Piano uh, sound sample set uh, from very small ROMs. Each of these ROMs are still, um, you know, around 16 to 32 megabytes. So still very, very compressed in what they do but this would have been a very used uh, piano sound within the late 90s, early 2000s. So as I mentioned before, this is a synth. So let's have a look at some of the synth capabilities and of course one of the first things you think about with a synth is its filters. Uh, so let's take a look at this simple patch here. This is a strings patch. So let's take a look at how this patch is made. So any patch inside of the Emu Proteus can be made of four different instruments or four different layers. So this L here, that is the layer that we're dealing with. So if we look, layer one is made out of a solo quartet layer two is a section, and then there is nothing in layers three and four. So let's take a look at the filter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the same filter onto all of those layers, um, and we'll have a listen to the different types. So this is first off the smooth filter. So this is a two pole filter, and it's the sort of thing that you would find on an Oberheim or other Emu uh, classic synths. So one of the great things about the Proteus is it has these onboard controls here and with these four different knobs you can control up to 12 different parameters by pressing this button and cycling through. Uh, so A to D, E to H and I to L. Now typically they also then get sent to these particular things by convention but you can patch this any way that you particularly want it to work. So here with the uh, tone and presence this is going to be the cutoff of the filter and the resonance. crank the resonance a bit. So let's compare that to the next filter, which is the classic filter. So this is more of the four pole that you'd expect to see on a Moog, uh, on an ARP, these types of uh, synthesizers. So you can definitely hear it stepping through those different poles. Let's take it up to the next one. This is a steeper one. So this is just a faster slope. So compare that back to the original Smooth. You can definitely hear the difference between them. There are loads more of different types of uh, filters in here. The Club Classic with lots of Ks. Millennium. And then we've got some high passes as well.
So as I mentioned earlier, the origins of Emu is actually making modular synthesizers. And in fact, that is exactly what is inside of this digital synthesizer. So let's start with another strings patch, this time actually coming from the ZR sound set. So of course, as well as a filter, you've got an amplifier, which can be controlled through envelopes, um, all sorts of different things. But what's really gets interesting past the LFOs, we get into the patch chords. And this is where it really does become like a modular synth. You can take any parameter and send it to any other par parameter. So you can see in this case, the mod wheel is going to the filter frequency of this particular patch, but we can patch these any way we want. And again, each layer can have its own different patching. So you can have four different layers, four different sets of patch chords. It's quite a sophisticated uh, patching system. So let's go to patch chord 24, which is currently blank. And I'm going to edit just layer one to start off with. So let's pick something to patch up here. So first off, I could be uh, affecting each of these A, B, C, Ds across here. So these could be all set up. And here I could be patching one of the LFOs, but I'm gonna pick white noise. And I'm going to send that to pitch. This will be interesting. Maybe crank that up a little bit. Pretty extreme, let's crank that down just a little bit. So this is really distorting the pitch really nicely in a sort of very crunchy way. And if we really want to go to Naughty Town, let's take some pink noise and send that into the pitch of layer two. So one more thing I wanted to talk about was the fact that the Proteus has multiple outputs. It has the main outputs, but it's also got two additional outputs. And these can be just standard outputs. So if you wanted to split certain sounds to go into different channels and then you could mix them separately in audio land, you can also use them as a send and return. So if you have the right kind of stereo Y cable, then you can actually send out to some outboard and then have it sent back in through the same channel and have that go to the outputs of the synth. So let's have a play with that now. So if you've seen my recent modular video, you'll see that I've been experimenting how I can send things between my DAW and my modular equipment. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to send stuff from the Proteus through into the modular and then come back through that effects return. So with a bit of clever patching through my Focusrite Scarlet, I've been able to send out through one of the sends into the Scarlet and then out through the ADAP light pipe and into my modular equipment. So I'm going to send it into the clouds here. So let's use this piano that we saw earlier. So instead of the mix output of this instrument going to the main, I'm going to send it to sub one, remembering that that is now going to act as an insert. So hopefully if we've got this right, And of course, I could be sending that out to the FX aid, maybe send some distortion or delays or to any of these other modular effects. Now, I went into how I set up things with my JV1080 with Logic in the previous video. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but just to quickly show something that I found out when setting up the Proteus, which was slightly different to the JV1080. So to allow me to change the programs inside of the Proteus using Logic, uh, very similar process. What we need to do is go into the MIDI environment 
and you can see I've got my Proteus custom here. I can lo load that up and you can see that I've set up all of these custom banks with their names which I found from one of the websites. So just copying them into here. Now the slight difference here is that this Proteus needs a custom bank message. It can't use one out of any of the boxes. I couldn't get any of these to work. And I think that's a little bit to do with the fact that the Proteus uses in its bank message how to select a particular ROM. So actually whether you've got a Proteus custom or a Proteus 2, or one of the other generation of these machines uh, it will be able to know if you've got that particular ROM inserted by one of the bank messages so there's a custom bank message and I'll show you uh, that in a second one very frustrating thing about logic is that you can only put in 15 banks of names um, now the composer ROM on side of the Proteus has got eight banks and many of the others have got four so you can see I'm immediately out of space to have named things so I have to prioritize which things I actually have named doesn't mean I can't control those other banks it just means that I can't have the nice pretty names for them to set up those custom bank messages then you basically go in and right click and click define custom bank messages and you can see these are those set up here so for bank zero one two three these are the banks inside of logic and um, how I'm going to map them so what it's going to do is it's going to send out these two commands so what this is saying is that control zero which is the bank MSB that is going to four that is the composer ROM number and then here we're saying we're going to select bank zero on that ROM so you can see down here I'm using a different bank MSB I've got 08 and that is selecting out the ZR um, and then it's saying this is the second slot on that bank. So this is how you set up these kind of custom bank messages to get all of this working. So in my JV1080 I also explored what other sounds there were out there that people were pre-programmed for the JV1080 and I showed some nice patches. There wasn't so much in the world of Proteus 2000, certainly nothing that's been made in the last few years that I could find where someone has put out a whole bank of different patches. But I did find something from back in history. So there was this Tweakheads website that I found here, Tweakheads Lab, and they actually had this Protis 2000 available in SoundDriver, but also available as a Sys exclusive MIDI file. So you can just download that and run that MIDI file inside of whatever you're using. So it could be Logic, could be any uh, particular DAW. So this uh, is what I did. You can see here I've imported that MIDI file. Now I had to do something a little bit special here because if you click this link on the current version, you'll see it doesn't go to a download. And this is where if you haven't come across Wayback Machine, it's, it's great for going back in history and finding uh, what a website was looking at at any particular point in time. So if we go back to this particular URL back in time, you can see all recent history. I'm going to go back to 2003, so slightly shortly after the Proteus 2000 was released. And if we go to February, we can go and see a snapshot of that whole page as it looked on that day. And fortunately at that point, then we can click and download and it downloads those patches and I can load them in. So let's take a look at some of those patches. So this is the EtherVox, very interesting instrument here. And it gets very interesting in the lower registers. Then there's this Temple Bats. Let's have a look at this ghost machine.
Now there is an application that you can use to control the Proteus from your computer. It's called ProDatum. Unfortunately, I just can't get the Mac version of this working. It might be just because of the fact that it hasn't been uh, compiled for the more modern uh, versions of Mac. And maybe someone out there might fancy trying and compiling it. So maybe the Windows version works, but the I can't get the Mac version to work. But I don't think that's so much of a problem because I find the Proteus much more intuitive in terms of navigating its menu system than, say, the JV1080. With my recent investigations into combining digital audio workstations with modular, it was very interesting to see how this digital synth had also been influenced by the modular format. And whilst analog synthesizers have come back into fashion once again, I think these digital synthesizers have a huge amount to offer. Do you have any digital outboard synths that you still like to use today? Let me know in the comments below. If you've enjoyed this video then please do give it a thumbs up, share and subscribe and I'll see you on the next one.